call the Sheboygan Common Council Committee of the whole meeting of Wednesday, May 2nd, 2012 to order. Uh, Madam City Clerk, would you call the roll? Bellinger? Here. Boren? Here. Carlson? Excuse? Decker? Here. Donahue? Here. Hammond? Here. Heideman? Here. Koth? Here. Lassard? Here. Lundowski? Here. Matichak? Here. Raisler? Here. Van Akron? Excused. Vanderweel? Excused. And Bercy? Excused. 11 present. Well, if we could stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. <coughs> I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We are on television tonight, so we will need our microphones. Uh, number four on the agenda is approval of the minutes from the March 14, 2012 meeting. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the meetings from Wednesday, March 14th. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Chair votes aye. Number five, we have a public forum on any agenda items. Anybody wish to be speak? I think the only member of the public is March tonight. Okay, we'll move on. Chairman's comments, I have none at this time. Uh, and then we have items for discussion only. <clears throat> Number seven, uh, aldermanic orientation and refresher. A, function duties of the committee of the whole. Uh, I'll be uh, making some comments along with attorney Steve McLean and I'll have attorney McLean go first, please. Uh, the only thing I can say about the function of the committee of the whole, it's covered by ordinance. Uh, committee of the whole says, uh, uh, meetings of the committee whole shall be held only as needed for budget deliberations and for the discussion of other important issues as determined by the chairman. Um, that's uh, historically the committee of the whole has met sort of on call. I think uh, in the way, way old days, uh, used to meet every Monday or every other men Monday uh, opposite the council meetings, but was determined that too many meetings and so it was cut back to sort of an on-call as needed basis and that's the way it has been functioning for quite a while uh, and if there are items you want to have discussed in committee of the whole you need to talk to the chair and uh, get a meeting set up and get it on the agenda that's all I've got thank you uh, I have just a few comments uh, <clears throat> um, I want to get into my uh, chairman's expectations and protocols uh, over the years in various capacities, both with the city, when I had my business, state organizations, local or organizations, I always served on a lot of committees, chaired a few committees, and I always found that at, at the beginning of a business year for whatever committee that was, that if the chairman had set up some expectations to what uh, he expected from his committee members, that generally the committee functioned very well and, and got accomplished what it was supposed to. So. Uh, I've made it a practice with the committees I've chaired with the city to uh, set up some protocols and I just want to go over a few of them with you briefly. Some of them are just housekeeping things of course. Uh, if at all possible, if you could arrive 10 minutes before the start of the meeting. Uh, if you're unable to attend a meeting, it would be late if you could call the city clerk's office or my cell phone number, which you all should have. Uh, <clears throat> Please remember that the committee of the whole needs a minimum of, not, of nine older persons to, for a quorum to co conduct city business. Uh, and I really would appreciate it if we didn't have any unexcused absences. I also would appreciate it if uh, cell phones and other electronic devices that are not pertinent to the operation of the meeting would be turned off and kept out of sight. I also would appreciate it if all the older persons would come to the meetings prepared to be an active participant by having read all of the documents uh, and materials prior to the meeting. I think one of the purposes of the committee of the whole is to have as many people uh, in on the discussion as possible. And please be prepared to be an active participant in all discussions. Uh, another housekeeping thing, some chairmen have handled this differently since I've been a member of the Common Council. Some chairmen have chose not to vote, not to vote at all on, on issues. That was their choice. Uh, my policy will be that I, if there's any roll call votes, that I will vote last on any roll calls. 
if you wish to speak, please press your, your button. Most of the time we'll be on television. Please, please acknowledge the chairman. Uh, each alder person will be allowed to speak three times in any agenda item. <clears throat> a full discussion of each agenda item will take place with no time limit within reason. Most meetings will not exceed two hours in length. I know previously there was some complaints when we had some chairman that uh, the meetings were too rushed and there wasn't a full airing of the issues. And I tended to agree with that that at the, at the, that at the time. However, you know, I don't want the meetings to be really dragged out, but I do want to have a full discussion until everybody's heard on the issues. The mayor is not a member of the Committee of the Whole. The mayor is welcome to attend the meetings and will be seated in the public seating area. The mayor speak, may speak at the chairman's discretion. And then uh, for maximum transparen uh, transparencies for the city of Sheboygan, I will attempt to have all of the Committee of the Whole meetings televised on channel 95 or 990. <clears throat> and uh, a public forum will be held for each committee the whole meeting with the exception of when we go into closed session for any, ag for any agenda item with a time limit of three minutes per person with no time extensions. No prior registration is required. Those wishing to speak will be called up from the audience by the chairman. And I'm hopeful with, with these uh, expectations and protocols that we will have a, a successful year with the Committee of the Whole, and I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Uh, we're we're going to move agenda item up uh, and go into closed session very shortly. But first, I wanted Steve to give his part of the presentation of what a committee, what a, what a committee of, I'm sorry, what a closed session is and whatever he wants to talk to us in, in that regard. Steve? <coughs> Uh, most of you are aware, uh, the city as a governmental body is subject to the open meeting law and the public records law of the state of Wisconsin, uh, which means under the open meeting law, every meeting of a governmental body must be preceded by a public notice and with limited exceptions, all business of a governmental body needs to be conducted in open session. That's the state law. Uh, the council is a governmental body. Each of the committees of the council are governmental bodies. Uh, so whenever you hold a meeting, you've got to follow the open meeting law, which requires public notice in advance. Generally, the law is 24 hours advance notice, uh, and it has to be disseminated, and we've got bulletin board in City Hall and several places uh, throughout the city where notices are posted, news media is advised. Uh, there is an exception under the statute for holding meetings uh, in, within less than 24 hours. Basically, it's an emergency type exception. Uh, if you couldn't have anticipated um, for whatever reason and need to uh, call an emergency session, uh, generally, then you have to give at least two hours advance notice. Uh, there's no definition as to what good cause is for that shorter period, the two hour period, but uh, uh, generally I'm contacted as to whether or not uh, you can meet in a shorter time period than 24 hours notice. Uh, and I'll provide advice to the chair or whatever uh, as to whether or not it's appropriate. Uh, a meeting is defined as the convening of members of the governmental body for the purpose of exercising the responsibilities, authority, powers, duties delegated to or vested in the body. The uh, reason that's important is uh, a lot of times you may be with a group of other aldermen and you're not, it doesn't dawn on you that this may constitute a meeting under the open meeting law. Uh, where this often arises is uh, where there are meetings of other governmental bodies, such as county board meeting or something like that, and there's some topic of interest to the city or to the city council, and uh, you find that there's a number of aldermen uh, attending the meeting. Now, if, uh, uh, if there's at least a quorum there, at least 
uh, a majority is presumed to be uh, enough to trigger the open meeting law. If you could have anticipated that those members were going to be there, uh, a notice should be put out in advance, again, 24 hours at least in advance, um, that uh, you may be attending this meeting of another governmental body and you're just there for observation or whatever and that you're not going to take any governmental action or any action as part of that. That's called a bad key notice um, after a case involving a guy named Badke. Um, as far as closed session, <clears throat> getting to that, uh, again, the presumption is that uh, all the business should be in open session unless there's uh, you fit within a specific exemption for closed session. Uh, even if you can fit into a specific exemption for a closed session, doesn't require you to go into closed session. Uh, the presumption is always there that uh, an open meeting is good. Uh, closed sessions are only uh, if necessary. And uh, for instance, one of the exemptions for going into closed session is on the uh, agenda tonight uh, under the exemption in subsection 1E for the purpose of deliberating the purchase of public property uh, where competitive and or bargaining reasons require a closed session. That's uh, what the purpose of the closed session tonight. Uh, as far as liability under the open uh, meeting law, uh, if if as an alderman uh, or committee member you are in attendance at an illegal open meeting or illegal public meeting, uh, you can be held personally uh, liable and fined uh, between, I think it's $50 and $200 if uh, the attorney general or the district attorney would bring a, an action uh, saying you attended an illegal meeting. A uh, couple ways to avoid liability if uh, that would be if you're in an illegal meeting or if you uh, participate in an illegal closed session of a meeting. Uh, one way to avoid that is uh, as to closed sessions if you are concerned that it might be an illegal closed session if you vote no and uh, uh, vote not to go into the closed session generally you won't be found personally liable for the violation of the open meeting law. Uh, or there's case law that uh, if you rely on advice of your local council who's providing advice and is, uh, has that role to provide advice uh, as to whether or not uh, you're in uh, <clears throat> compliance with the open meeting law and you follow that advice, generally you, generally you won't be sued and, and or be found uh, personally liable for a violation of the open meeting law. Uh, but I think as far as uh, closed sessions, uh, one other aspect, uh, closed sessions are intentionally designed as closed sessions. The, the idea is that the items you're going to discuss there are confidential and uh, need to stay confidential. They're not to be disseminated to the public. Uh, that ties into one of the sections in our ethics code dealing with uh, confidential information. Uh, <clears throat> basically, it, it says, and this, this uh, is, binds all city employees and city officials, um, no city official or employee shall, without proper legal authorization, disclose confidential information concerning the property, government, or affairs of the city, nor shall he use such information to advance the financial or other private interests of himself or others. Uh, so it's an ethics violation for you to uh, disclose <coughs> confidential information uh, to others. And I know there has been, there have been allegations back and forth over the years. Uh, uh, individual circumstances about whether or not there have been violations of the open meeting law or or the confidentiality provisions but it's it's an important obligation on your part if it is uh, I know uh, it's a concern you want to do the public's business and to the extent possible uh, those things are done in open session but there are legitimate 
uh, reasons, and the state recognizes that, for local governmental bodies to go into closed session, and those things need to stay closed. Uh, question is, how long do they, are they confidential? Uh, generally, when uh, the, the purpose for the closed session and the uh, rationale for the confidentiality no longer exist, then generally it's no longer confidential and therefore could be disclosed. Um, again, I guess uh, if anyone has a specific issue on that or a question as to should they disclose something that was discussed in a, in a closed meeting, uh, I'd appreciate a phone call or some conversation with you before you decide to make the decision to uh, release that information publicly. Um, I think that's... that's uh, Steve, one thing, you, if you could touch on a little more specifically, we have five standing committees, and I, if you would go over uh, the importance of avoiding walking quorums, what is a walking quorum, and what entails, why do you have to be careful about that? Okay, again, a, a meeting is, uh, a, uh, as I said, defined as the convening of members of the governmental body for purpose of exercising responsibilities, authorities, powers, and duties delegated to or vested in the body. Uh, if you're, uh, you go to the ball game with uh, some uh, colleagues that, who are also aldermen and you start talking about uh, city business, uh, theoretically you're engaging in governmental business, uh, so there's a, a purpose test on whether or not you've got a, a meeting or not, and there's, there's a number test. If uh, you and a, and a fellow alderman, you're talking uh, shop and you're talking about issues that come before the city, uh, you're definitely discussing city business, but it's not uh, an open meeting because it's just two of you and you're not basically you're not a quorum of uh, any body now uh, sometimes we run into issues where you got three member committees uh, we just did away with the risk management committee but that was one where there are three aldermen on the committee uh, argument that discussion between the between two of the three uh, over items that are uh, germane to that committee would constitute a, uh, a meeting that would have to be noticed. Uh, that's about as far out as you go. Usually most of the standing committees are five members. Uh, so if you've got three aldermen talking about a subject that is uh, germane to that committee and you haven't noticed that it's a meeting, you uh, uh, should cease discussing that business and uh, because you may trigger the open meeting law, uh, perhaps inadvertently, but still uh, it can be there. Uh, then to make things even more uh, convoluted, there's a, a case that says even if you don't have, let's, let's say uh, you don't have a majority of the uh, aldermen together talking shop, um, but you've got a few and let's say the, the vote requires, uh, say, to uh, alter the budget requires a two-thirds vote, and that's uh, 11 members. If you've got six members meeting and talking about budget issues and how to, how to change the budget or how to uh, prevent altering the budget or whatever, uh, that's what's called a negative quorum. If you, there's enough members there that could stop the action of the parent body, in other words, by voting no when you need two-thirds to, to adopt something, um, that can constitute illegal meetings as, as well if it's not noticed. Um, I don't know how much you want me to go into this uh, before we get into the closed session. I think, that's, I think that's fine. Yeah. Thanks, Attorney McLean. Uh, for those that are watching on television, we're going to be going into closed session for a few minutes, but we will be going back on television after the closed session. Uh, President Hammond, would you like to make the motion to go into closed session? Absolutely. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Motion to convene in closed session of the exemption provided in Section 19.85, subsection 1, subsection E, Wisconsin statutes, for the purpose of deliberating the, uh, the purchasing of public property where competitive and bargaining reasons require a closed session. 
We have a motion and a second to go into closed session. Can we do this on all eyes or do we need a roll call? Roll call. Roll call, please. Bellinger? Aye. Boren? I'll vote last. Okay. Decker? Aye. Donahue? Aye. Hammond? Aye. Heideman? Aye. Koth? Aye. Lassard? Aye. Lewandowski? Aye. Matichek? Aye. Raisler? Aye. And Boren? Aye. 11 ayes. We now are in closed session. We'll give uh, the television people just a couple minutes to turn off the cameras, and I believe Chad Pellet is under number seven, item B, is the role of the mayor's office, and we'll be hearing from our, our Mayor, mayor Terry Van Akron. Mary, you're on. <laughs> I, just, I just threw a lifesaver in my mouth, too, as I was walking in. Um, why don't you talk a little bit tonight about the role between you as the council and me as the mayor. You know, each mayor has his own little way of doing things, and uh, I appreciate what, what we did here tonight with bringing stuff to you. You, you guys, the 16 of you, are, are the ones that make the, the decisions. It's not the mayor, it's not the staff, and we've got to keep you informed. And this is what the whole meeting tonight was. Before we get too much further down the road, and, and we need to have um, your guidance on whether this is something we should be spending our money or spending our time on. Uh, we, we could go a long ways and then come back to you and, and have you stop the whole plan. Um, this way, like we did tonight, I think is, is appropriate that we got to keep you in the loop. And that's, that's my major goal in the next year that I'm here is uh, to keep you guys informed and keep these things way ahead that you know before the public. There's nothing worse as an alderman than to get a phone call at home and say, hey, I heard on the street that something's happening on the north side what's going on and you guys don't know it. But it's been discussed, you know, in other places uh, in, as city uh, staff or whatever, um, or between the chamber and, and us, and you not being kept in that loop. So it's my, my intentions is to keep you involved more and more than you probably have been in, in the past and, and have you making those decisions uh, with, with our guidance. And I be your liaison between Jim and the fire department and the rest of the departments um, to keep you in, informed and, and keep you updated on those things. As mayor, I'm, I'm on the uh, plan commission and the transit commission, so I'll be serving as, as a partner on some of the commissions with you. Um, but again, my, my major goal is that we all work together and continue to, to get the information because as, as aldermen, you need that information to make the, the right decisions, right or wrong. Um, we're going to do that. And, and the political sides, as we talked just a few minutes ago, there's a lot of political sides besides just bottom line. And, we, you know, together, you and I are going to face those political sides. Um, department heads and other people aren't elected. We're the ones that are going to get the phone calls about any political decisions or any policy decisions. And I think that's what we're going to do is make the policy decisions, make the long-term goals in policy. Um, and then have the department heads and, and Jim fill out and go out and um, do those policies and follow those procedures. And that's our, that's our, our main role, is to set it and then not mi micromanage what they do. I think we, st we, we want them to stay out of the political and the policy side, and we then got to give them some, some leeway on, and trust that they can go out and do those things. So that's what I'm looking for. My door's always open. I've uh, talked to all of you all already and, and if you have any problems don't don't uh, don't hesitate to stop in give me a call you all have my cell phone number um, give me a call at any time if you have any questions about anything and um, we can work it out together anybody have any question mayor on the uh, commissions or committees uh, I know I tr I'll, I'll be serving with you on transit but like the plan commission you actually chair that one right I actually chair the plan commission, and then transit, I think we vote for a chairman mm -hmm. on the transit committee, but I actually chair the plan commission. Thank you. Any other questions for the mayor? Thank you, mayor. Thank you. Next we have uh, under agenda item 7C, the role of the chief administrative officer, our CEO, Jim Amorio. Yeah, sure I did. <laughs> no, uh, time's up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, right. I'm going to do everything that the mayor's not doing. So I got somebody's got to pick up the rest of the stuff. So that's what it's, <laughs> um, 
You know, one of the responsibilities to develop and implement a budget. Uh, that's my responsibility. And probably in a few weeks at our next meeting, um, we've gone through a budget cycle very early this year, and I'll be presenting the ups and the downs, the goods and the bads from that. So we can look at that expense side, take a little peek at revenue, because we get the majority of our revenue at the end of the year from the state. So uh, that's coming up in the next couple of weeks. Also, from that, to look a little further out, <clears throat> two, three, and five year plan and step off that current plan that we have. So the city's really never had a strategic plan, if you will, uh, but we're going to be putting one together this year. Uh, one of the other things that drives, that primarily drives that is, is IT. And what are we going to do for systems uh, within, uh, and, and technology within the city? So we've got, uh, we've chartered Dave Augustin, who's the IT manager, uh, through uh, finance committee meetings to go off and look at each department, look at what their needs are, what they do, how they do it, why they do it, what data do we share, and get all of that stuff together, get it on a flow chart, and then we can sit down and make some decisions and say, okay, what's the path we need to take? What, what are the resources? What are the costs? And we'll have that done later on uh, this year so that we can all take a look at that and from a strategic standpoint decide where we want to go and then based on that put together some numbers uh, from a budgetary standpoint uh, to see where that will take us. Uh, one of the other things is succession planning. Uh, again, for critical areas, department heads or other key people in the organization, we really haven't had succession planning. So we've got to develop that and get key people in place so that they have the ability to train under these other people who are close to retirement. Um, another good thing is to establish um, guidelines and procedures to help facilitate communications between the city and our citizens. And I think we've taken one of the first steps this year in developing on our website uh, with the help of Dave and Chad um, to put a complaints uh, log out there where we actually log in complaints from citizens, older persons, anybody who has complaints, either direct the citizen to go to the website and log it in themselves. You can do it for them. We'll be happy to do it here. But once we do that, we then record the, the process that it goes through. So Chad and Dave will then review these every morning. We'll assign them to the appropriate departments. The departments will have, uh, which is normal and customary, 10 working days to respond uh, to the customer issue complaint so that we have a track of the complaints that came in, how we responded, <coughs> and where they satisfied. Uh, we haven't had that before. A lot of things fall through the cracks, but uh, we're getting a lot better now because we have one repository for all of this information. Um, I act as the public information officer in case there's, and I didn't really know what that meant, so it's like we have an outbreak of mad cow disease. I'm the representative that talks to the rest of the world about what's happening in the city. So um, any of those kinds of things I, I am responsible for. I also have fiduciary responsibility uh, to, uh, with the library and the transit. Um, system only because they're using tax levy dollars from the city so I make sure that I attend the, the meetings um, and make sure that they're spending their money appropriately and within their budget. Um, also involved with Chad uh, and with Don, uh, SCEDC takes up a lot of our time but again extremely important to the city and the county for developing new business leads and new business development and job creation. Um, also, one of my primary roles, as in today, is to make sure that I consult with the mayor uh, and the council uh, to make sure that as these emerging issues come up, that we fully explain those to make sure everybody understands, and then, based on those decisions, carry that, that message forward. So that's kind of in a nutshell what I do. Any questions for Mr. Modio? Jim, I've got one, I th one I'd like you to comment on about, I think it's about two weeks ago now, the county took a very key vote uh, to proceed with the 9-11 combined dispatch, what is going to be the next hoops we have to go through and how are you going to be involved in that? Um, at the mayor's direction, he asked uh, Chief Domagowski to set a meeting up at least with the city side so that we could strategize and look at, you know, what our offer would be based on where we ended up uh, from uh, a cost standpoint. And then with everybody's blessing, propose that to the county. Good. I wasn't sure if it was th th tomorrow or Friday. Good. Thanks for the update. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay. My door's always open. Anytime, call.
I will uh, go down to item D, and that is uh, board docs and aldermanic email system, and uh, our presenter is our IT manager, Dave Augustine. Got a screen? Yep. Okay. Thank you, council members. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm Dave Augustine, your IT manager, and where I take care of obviously the IT department, but I'm sure not if you know also the TV station WSES. So that reports to me as well, so we're working with both things. Um, what I have is a little handout that I emailed you all, which I just wanted to go through, and what it is. Just a simple user guide that you'll have. I just wanted to go through. Not back yet? Oh, I know what's going on. Move this out. There. It should come back now our wireless signal has got to go around the corner it was cut off there it comes okay <coughs> um, well I'd like to start out with board docs and board docs was implemented because one of the goals I was given is to with another team to go paperless as much as we can because in printing out all the council packets for every meeting what were we spending about 18,000 a year At least. just on paper and labor so that's why we researched and went to um, the solution called board docs First of all, um, if you ever need any technical assistance with accessing our systems, you can contact our IT help desk at 3370 or you can just email me once you access the system as well. Um, again, we use board docs right now. It's our tool to use for our official record for city council meetings, agendas and minutes. Um, basically to get to it, you can go to this link, which is in your handout, or you can get to it from the city website when you go to meetings and agendas. Um, just to bring up an example, as far as board docs, this is what it'll look like. So we'll have a history of meetings out there so you can go back any time to it. And then say you want to look at the previous one, you can look at it. And it will come up, and there it is. Here's where you'll have the option to either you can view the agenda, if you want to view it online, or you can print it out uh, if you'd like yourself. And when you click on printing, there it is. You basically have three details. You can do a, uh, uh, just a simple agenda. You have the detail agenda or just the current item that you're on. And then you can print it out to get your own summary thing that you can bring to council meetings or you'll be able to follow along online. As you'll see then, what we also do is um, Clerk Richards also puts in in the minutes of you know everything what the minutes are as well as in how everybody voted so that way everybody can go back and look at that as well which is what you saw in the ag current agenda item so she'll go back in and put it in and it'll be how everybody voted or roll call as far as that goes um, pretty straightforward pretty easy to use um, like I said, all the steps are basically right in here in this handout that you have for board docs. Okay? Any questions on board docs? Okay. The next item we'll bring up is accessing your city email from outside. Um, what you can do is go to our main city website which is www.cityofsheboygan.info. Um, on there, then, there is a link called Employee Logon, which should be right here. Simply click on it, and then it will bring you to a sign-on screen, where then you should have been given your user ID and password. The key to remember here is when you enter, there's a domain name, and that's just Sheboygan. So it's S-H-E. 
P-O-Y-G-A-N, followed by this slash, and then your username, and then your password. And then if I could type right. <laughs> now you got to use your boy spell right. <laughs> I never got an E in typing, so. There we go. And it brings you right in your email. And this is your city email. <clears throat> as far as that goes. And then if you, you have your functions, like I said, if you want to email anybody in the city or if you have to email me for any reason, you can, the address book is right there that you can do a search on. So, as far as that goes. Dave, back when we started uh, the, city, the city email system, mm -hmm. I, under my favorites, I have a, a, a topic, it just says city emails, and I go directly to the sign-in without having to go to the city's website. It makes it a little quicker. Correct. I, th I think you helped me set that up at that time. Correct, yes. But it, it is a little quicker that way. Yep. Is yeah, if what you can do is when you go to that link, you can copy that page right there and then make it a favorites in your Internet Explorer so that way you don't have to go to the city website first, definitely. Definitely. Um, again, in the handout, here again all the steps are, and, and I've got the circles where you would do things, like here with the domain name where I got it. For the domain name user, enter, you know, like I said, Sheboygan, your unique user ID, and then your password. So, and then you have your emails. Any questions about accessing your email? And you can do this from any computer at home or if there's a public computer, whatever. So, uh, along with the email subject, we also have, like I said, cell phones and personal devices. Uh, we now have the capability of setting up email on devices other than Blackberries, like iPhones or Androids. So that is a function we can set up too, as far as that goes. I think most of them only let you get one email in at a time though, right? As far as one email setting, like the Androids and stuff. Um, you can have two of them on there, but as far as one, you go to your email, it goes to one? Um, that's what I wanted to talk about as well, where um, Attorney McLean and I had talked about that because where this comes into then is a matter of what's subject to public record. Um, iPads and iPhones allows you to set up, <coughs> excuse me, uh, multiple email accounts. And this is where it's going to be important. So let's say you take your personal device. That's where the pub, um, access for open records come in. If you, ha if you can set up two email accounts like your own personal one and then your work email as long as they are kept separate your personal items are not subject to public records. Now, the other addition to that is for city business, you need to be using your city email account. For private business, you need to be using your personal email account. Say if you would use your personal email account for city business, then that information becomes a matter of public record. So that's something to think about before you set up or want to set something up on your personal devices. I think the Android does allow separate email accounts. Sure, you can, but you can only monitor. Excuse me, Alderman Raisler, could you use your microphone, please? Okay. Thank you. You can only send, you can only have one set up at a time, so when you hit your email, it goes to whichever one you have primary. You have to physically go into the settings and, and, reset, and reset it to a different one. Where the iPhones, you can have, like I said, multiple apps Correct. for different. So uh, that's one of the thing to keep in right. mind, absolutely. Absolutely, but this is something um, we didn't have before, so when I guess I'm experimenting with you because I know there's been some requests. So to set it up, uh, just schedule some time with me and then we'll get it set up. Um, that's especially for Alderman Hammond as well, so. <laughs> so, um, any questions on cell phones or setting it up or getting your private, okay. As we'd also talked about, as um, Mr. Modio talked earlier, I just wanted to go in, you know, as far as on the website, here again too, you'll have instructions as far as where people can s submit their inquiries basically to the city where they can, like I said, the page will open up where they can just request for general information, um, building code violations, tall grass, snow removal issues, and then abandoned vehicles, graffiti, garbage, or dog issues. Basically all they do is click on there 
and then they'll be able to fill out whichever. And then what happens is, is an e email will come into the city that Chad and myself get, and then we'll take a look at it, and then based on what the issue is, we will assign it to the correct person so it's resolved quickly. And then once they provide an answer, we get an email back saying, hey, here's the answer. We can review it to make sure everything's correct, and then the, the response gets sent back out to the citizen. So, and it's been working pretty good. I think right now we've got maybe five open issues that are, people are working on right now. And since we turned this up last November, I think roughly we have about 120 inquiries or so that we've handled, something like that. So it's working, you know, pretty nice that people are getting, you know, followed back up to. So, so I get those like um, Jim had said, you can fill these out yourself, or you can, you know. If citizens come to you or whatever, you can refer them to that as well to fill it out. <clears throat> and it's not meant as, you know, passing the buck or anything. What this is meant as, you know, like Jim said, so nothing falls through the cracks. Um, you know, so you don't, let's say somebody gives you a phone and message and you write it down and you forget about it. This way, if they submit it, it's there. It's tracked. We can follow up with it and make sure that the right answer gets out. So, and so far, it's been working really well. Any questions? <clears throat> okay, the last one I have on here is our wireless network. Um, here at City Hall, we have what we call a public network, where if you have your devices and you bring it up, uh, the network is actually called City Hall Public. It requires a password, and you can get the password from either the clerk's office or IT for what the password is. And then we'll get you that, and that way then if you're here doing for whatever reason for meetings, you have you know wireless here that you can get connected to. The other thing you can do then is follow along and board docs online if you have a device that way as they're going through the agenda. That's another use for it, so. Anyway, that's pretty much what I had. Dave, I've got a question for you, and I can't remember if I talked to you about this or Sue about this, but when we actually have a council meeting and we're doing our voting with our clickers, uh, it goes up there on a one or a two, one for yes, two for mm -hmm. no, uh, depending on when we do our clickers. So it's not an alphabetical order or anything. So I've heard from some constituents that watch on television that they can't see how their aldermen are voting because if it would, if it would be an alphabetical, in other words, if you had a yes column and a no column mm -hmm. and it came up in an alphabetical order starting with Alderman Bellinger and then me for the yes column and then whoever voted no, the people on television could follow that a lot closer to see how their older persons voted. Is that something in the software that can be done? We'll have to make a, I've looked at the software to see what we can do and it's definitely gonna be an involvement with our technical support to see if it's a capability or I'm gonna have to come with up with another workaround to help satisfy that request. Okay, thank so, you, thank you. No, it's still there as an item for us to do. Okay, thanks. So. <coughs> Alderman Bellinger. Thank you, Chairman. What is our, legal responsibility as far as deleting emails? I mean, can we delete any of them or do we have to save them for a certain period of time or put them in, you know, with the open records law? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. You can delete emails, no problem. The reason why you want to use your city email to conduct city business is, is we archive all the emails that are sent and received. So for public records, when we get them, we can pull them from that device or that storage area so we don't run into that problem. Otherwise, if you use your personal email for city business, then if you have you know, services that don't archive those emails or whatever, then as the keeper of those, you're responsible to you know, try and produce them. That's why I encourage you or as a standard, use your city email because then we can always retrieve it for archival purposes for open records requests. It's so much better under this system with having the city take care of the city emails because back before we went to this system a couple of years ago we had a, uh, an information request from one of the Sheboygan Press reporters when we were using our personal email accounts. We had to email, we had to send all of those emails to the Sheboygan Press and I think I, think I sent like, it must have been 70 or 80 of them and it's a nightmare. Mm -hmm. So that, going to the city system where they archive them mm -hmm. and you use your, your personal email account just for your personal emails and use the city, you know, we're not gonna run into that anymore. It's just been a godsend from that standpoint. 
Mm -hmm. So if we ever do get an open request, like I said, we can take care of it in IT to get them for you for the emails. Alderman Kath. Thank you, Chairman. At some point, should we clean up our emails? Like, yes. delete the spam or the, the agendas or the minutes? Yes, you can do that whenever, if you feel something you don't need to keep, yes, definitely delete it. Or usually what I do, as a practice that I do, is I use my inbox just for stuff to look at, and I'll make subfolders if I'm going to keep them underneath the inbox and file them, and then everything else I just delete, and then when I get out, I delete the deleted items. I do not use, like, deleted items as a historical recall thing. That's where I meant for that. When you get out, it's junk. It's gone. Okay. So... And if anybody wants a demo or that to see that, by all means, contact me and I can show you how to do that. Because I take after Jim, my door's always open as well, so. <laughs> so. Um, the other attachment that you got in your email is, a lot of you have seen this, but Chad Pelichek put together a cheat sheet as far as navigating on our website, as far as what functions do what. And... Like I said, you can play with it. A lot of it is like agendas and minutes where your employee signs on. We are also, you know, with our Twitter feeds, requests for info. So a lot of these are on there as well as what I've already talked about, but I've sent this along with you as well so you can reference it. So. Thanks. Madam City Clerk. Um, just to comment when Dave was talking about... Um, using the complaint form, another value to that is, is that we are then drastically cutting down how many council documents we're running through to a committee. I mean, if you can send it through, have them send it through, or you send it through, it's getting directly handled perhaps by the department that needs to handle it rather than waiting for the three week cycle that it goes through, it cuts down on the meeting times. So it's a really good tool. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Any other questions? The other thing I would like to bring up is, um, Mr. Chair, when you talked about um, being on TV, we also have, if you want to add or whatever, is we also now can stream to the Internet Live so people can actually watch the meeting on the Internet Live as we're going as well. And that can be uh, accessed through our webpage at wscssheboygan.com. So we also stream live now to the Internet for our, our city hall feed and our feed over at our studio at the UW. So just thought I'd let you know that as well. Thank you. Okay. Next we have item E, <coughs> Council Policies and Procedures, Role of the City Clerk's Office, City Clerk Sue Richards. Boy, is this going to be fast. Okay. You have a packet on your desk that says City Clerk's Office, and what I've done is I'll just briefly go through what's in there. Basically, the first set is kind of a very general um, information about our office. I've listed all of our staff members, their emails, um, the fact that we're open from 8 to 5 every day, Monday through Friday, including the lunch hour. Um, you, and you already know that you can use your key fob to get into the building between 7 a.m. and 8 p.m., seven days a week, in case you need to come up here, use your desk for whatever reason. Um, one of my suggestions would be, and I didn't write it on here, is to get to know your department heads and your managers. Uh, familiarize yourself with their departments and what they do. I've, over the years, I've heard from aldermen that say that the ones that do that are much more knowledgeable on what the departments are doing. So when it comes before the council, you know what they're about. So I would really recommend making an appointment with some of the department heads and the managers and just find out what they do. Um, we already talked about the agendas need to be posted at least 24 hours prior to any meeting. Um, the council agenda, when I finish it on board docs, which is usually by Friday before the council meeting, I will always email you to your city email account and say that I've made it active on the website, then you can access it over the weekend. Um, basically, any board uh, committee or commission of the city has to keep a record of all of their, of their actions in their meeting, and they must be into my office so that I can distribute them within 96 hours of that meeting. Uh, we struggle sometimes with following that, but we need to do our best to get that in. Um, 
This is a big one and it's very simple. I have to have a deadline for getting council documents into me so that I can proceed to get them into board docs. It's always five o'clock the Wednesday prior to the council meeting with the exception of public protection and safety which meets on Thursday or Wednesday night rather so I take their documents early Thursday morning. If it's not there then, then we move it to the next council meeting. I just have to set some kind of draw a line in the sand somewhere and that seems to be working out. I listed something on here as far as some of the things that we do in the clerk's office. I'm not going to go through all of those. One thing that I was talking with one of the gentlemen out at um, WSCS, he did mention that when you're at a council meeting, you do need to have your mic on you. They have a trouble picking it up if you're like this talking and holding it and things. So he asked me to just mention that. Okay, next on the list is the business order, uh, business card order form. It basically just shows you a couple of samples. I used mine and I used Jim's. And you just need to fill this out if you want them. If you don't think you need them, let's not waste the money. We do pay for the first 250. After that, forevermore, you will be responsible for reordering your your business cards. So get that to me if you desire those. Could I just make a point there? So uh, I think most of you have gotten a business card from me. Uh, the, it says here the back side is optional. One thing that my constituents have really appreciated is on the back of the card, I list the 8th district and then the wards I represent. And for example, Ward, ward 24, where they vote, and then the other two wards. And uh, the, the constituents that I give out my cards to are really appreciative of that, especially now that the voting places have all changed. So you might want to consider uh, putting that on the second side. It's entirely up to you, but my constituents have really liked it. And the cost is negligible. It's like a couple three dollars extra for us to print the back. So if you want to have it, just put it on there that you would like to have it and we'll fill it in for you. Next sheet is just a total listing of um, all of you, your emails, your home addresses, and your phone numbers. Make note that on Mary Lynn's, it is in the email address. It's not Don Ahu, it's Don Ohu. If you could change that, we'll send another one out later. The next thing in your packet is something that the council passed last year. And it's a, just a good review, especially for the new older persons. It's generally used rules of order, procedure, and conduct for all meetings. Just review it. It's just very basic how you should handle yourself, how things are handled in a meeting. Just wanted to give everybody a copy of that. The last thing, um, the new older person got the, the new older person's got this. This is this um, book from the League of Municipalities. It's excellent. It's called The Handbook for Wisconsin Municipal Officials. It's on loan to you throughout your term. Um, it's like a library thing. I check them out and I want them back when you're not serving anymore. So use these um, for all the men that have been here before and haven't had this and want one. I do have a few extras, so if you would like those, you'd be more than welcome to them. And that's it. Thank you very much, Sue. Any questions for the city clerk? Okay, uh, next we've got item number F. Legal authority, overview for older persons, open meetings, public records, code of ethics, and our city attorney Steve McLean will be discussing this part of the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, passing out a handout that's I put together sort of an overview. I won't cover all of this. Uh, uh, you guys have to give me some feedback as to how long you want to go. I, I'll stay as long as you want, but uh, uh, first thing I'd like to talk about is some things that have been discussed and... I would say I would say if we could be out of here turning the clean by maybe 25 or 22 at the latest. 22, 10? Uh, <laughs> no, that would, that would be, uh, that would be nine. <laughs> okay. Uh, one thing, as far as emails, uh, this issue has, has grown a lot in the last five years or so. Uh, the importance of using your city email account for conducting city business. Uh, you're a, a public, as a public official, you're an authority under the public records law. You have custody of your records. Your records include your governmental emails. Uh, so as Alderman, uh, as Chairman Bourne indicated, 
Uh, prior to having the city email accounts, you used your personal email account. You needed to maintain those and not delete those because they were subject to uh, requests for public records by uh, anybody in the public. Uh, and under the public records law, uh, anybody can make a request for any public records and uh, you've got to provide them. We've, we've gotten a lot of requests, especially uh, very recently with the casino issue being hot and heavy. There are, there's a public interest group out there that's anti-casino. Uh, they've got a law firm who's been making, has made uh, two series of public records requests. Uh, the most recent one was directed to all the aldermen. They, they copied, they sent it to me, but I, I forwarded it all to all the aldermen for emails to and from aldermen uh, relating, anything relating basically to the casino or the tribe or any, uh, any of the parties involved there that you might have. Uh, so if, if you do your city business on the city email system, the server maintains those and it saves you trouble and it's a lot uh, more likely to comply with the open uh, public records law where we can retrieve those. Uh, and what I typically do is when we get those requests and they're directed to all the aldermen, I uh, send them out to the aldermen, let them know that uh, if it's all right with the aldermen, we will uh, work with IT to retrieve those uh, off the server and we'll make those available uh, pursuant to the law to whoever the requester is. If you don't want us to do that and you want to dig out your own emails, uh, you certainly can, but, uh, uh, or if you want to review whatever gets released prior to uh, the, the response going out, let me know. But uh, at least from an email standpoint, uh, most of the public records requests anymore we get are for emails. Uh, there's fewer and fewer requests for hard copies. But uh, anybody making a public records request, if they're requesting records from you, it can be email, it can be hard copy, whatever. You are, as I say, you are the custodian of your records. If you've got... Uh, records, anything, council agendas, things like that, those are public records. Now, uh, the good news is a lot of the things that you acquire uh, are also kept in the clerk's office or they're online uh, or they're in the emails and we can retrieve those uh, without you having to dig through those things. But if you've got personal correspondence, uh, when I say personal, I mean city correspondence, you send out letters to your constituents. Uh, those, those are uh, business emails or letters and you need to maintain those. And, and we've got a uh, city retention schedule established. Generally, uh, need to keep hard copies of records or email copies of records for uh, at least six years. Uh, as I say, we've got the server with the emails that we maintain those, uh, so you don't need to worry about that. You can delete your own version uh, off off your uh, device or whatever, uh, as long as we're maintaining the the copies uh, on the server. Um, Dave, Do you have permission to add? May I have permission to speak? <coughs> One thing I just wanted to bring you guys up to also is our process when we do receive an open records request. What will happen is we'll get the records request and then I contact Sue Richards, Attorney McLean, and Jim Amodio to make sure that, yes, we should fulfill this request to make sure it meets all the criteria and then we work on the request and send it out. So that's our process as well internally to make this happen. So I just wanted to bring that to you all so you're familiar with the process that does go on. So 
and at least to my knowledge, uh, all the emails that you gather in your search have they come to my office before they go out. Correct. I look through every one to see if there are some. Sometimes there are confidential things that uh, don't do not have to be released, and uh, if there are, uh, sometimes, for instance, uh, there's attorney-client privilege if. Uh, if there's some communication between you and uh, our office, uh, that may be uh, privileged from being released as a public record because it uh, falls under the attorney-client privilege or uh, 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 you know, some confidentiality provision. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, so far it's been bearable. We, in the Angela Payne lawsuit, as far as emails, it took me uh, two weeks to go through emails in response to, uh, that wasn't an open records request, that was a discovery request. Uh, they can get a lot more stuff through discovery request. <clears throat> but it, I diligently go through all those and make sure that the, uh, if there's anything that needs to be redacted, uh, it's redacted, or if it doesn't need to be disclosed, uh, hold back on it, but uh, <clears throat> okay. Enough about uh, public records and and emails. Uh, getting back to my outline, I, I won't go into the uh, the city laws and so forth. They're, they're statutory, but the authority of the council is covered under the statutes. The mayor and the alder persons are the council. So it's not just the alder persons that are the common council. The mayor is included. And your powers, very broad, except as elsewhere in the statute specifically provided, the council shall have the management and control of the city property, finances, highways, navigable waters, and the public services, and shall have power to act for the government and good order of the city for its commercial benefit and for the health, safety, and welfare of the public. Very broad. So except as elsewhere in the statutes provided, you have authority over the running of the city. Um, parliamentary procedure, the city uses Robert's Rules of Order, uh, although there are a couple of nuances that the city has adopted over the years that are contained in our municipal code. Uh, for instance, one is uh, on uh, suspension of the rules, under Robert's Rules of Order, uh, you can request suspension of the rules, not suspension of the rules. Uh, um, the, uh, where you have acted on uh, an agenda item and at the next council meeting, you want to rescind that, that vote uh, rescission under Robert's rules you can do that at the next council meeting uh, under our ordinances you can only reconsideration there we go uh, you can only do a reconsideration at at the current meeting so you can't reconsider at a subsequent meeting what you have to do is let's say you uh, adopt a particular resolution uh, at the between then and the next meeting you think better of it uh, what you're going to have to do is bring, get something back on the agenda uh, seeking to repeal what you just enacted uh, if you don't catch it at, at the current meeting. Um, but primarily, Robert's Rules of Order apply. Uh, <clears throat> covered meetings, the mayor only votes in the event of a tie. The mayor has veto power. In Sheboygan, uh, we have a charter ordinance that authorizes the mayor to do a line item budget veto. That's not true in every city, but the mayor can line item veto budget items. Uh, any veto by the mayor, and, and frankly, I don't recall the mayor vetoing anything uh, in the last 24 years, but that's certainly theoretically possible. Uh, but any veto by the mayor has to happen within 
uh, five or six days, comes back to the council, and the council gets the right to override the veto, similar to what you see in the state or federal legislature. Um, one thing that I, I <clears throat> came to mind when we were discussing closed sessions, the issue often arises as, as an alderman, am I entitled to, am I entitled to have the right to be in a particular closed session of a particular meeting? Uh, the answer is, if it's, if it's a council meeting or a committee of the council, aldermen have the absolute right to be in a closed session, even if you're not a member of that committee. But it does not give you the right, for instance, the redevelopment authority, the library board, transit commission, uh, water utility, a uh, number of others. Those are not committees of the council. Those are separate bodies. An alderman does not have an entitlement to be in a closed session of those meetings. That doesn't mean the uh, membership might not allow you to be in there. Uh, but you don't have entitlement to be there. But if you're not a member of the finance committee and their finance committee is having a closed session and uh, you're interested in being there as an alderman, you've got the right to be there without getting permission of the chair or the rest of the committee. Uh, <clears throat> quorum for the council as a council is two thirds, not a majority. Uh, but all other committees and things, it, it's a majority. There's one exception to that that encountered uh, yesterday, and I'd forgotten about it, was uh, the board of, it's now the board of Marina Parks and Forestry. Um, by ordinance, it's a, now a 10 member body, and by ordinance, a quorum is five. And uh, that was a recent change where prior to adding the Marina membership, it was just the Board of Parks and Forestry. There were eight members, and by ordinance, we had allowed for four being a quorum. And I think historically that must have uh, arose because at one time they had trouble getting a quorum of the Board of Parks and Forestry. So typically, uh, in a 10 member committee, you would need six as a majority, but by ordinance, we allow five. Uh, Votes, confirmation of appointments have to be by the ayes and nays. In other words, roll call votes. Uh, same with adoption of measures, levying taxes, appropriating or dispersing money or creating any liability or charge against city or city funds. Uh, there are certain items that require more than a majority vote. Um, and I've got a whole list of them that I keep where special votes are required. One I mentioned a minute ago to amend a budget. Uh, to adopt the budget is a majority vote. To amend the budget requires a two-thirds vote. Uh, to suspend the rules, uh, this was getting, getting at before as far as the difference between our ordinances and Robert's Rules of Order. Robert's Rules of Order uh, you need a two-thirds vote to suspend the rules. Our ordinance requires three-quarters. So that's 12 as opposed to 11. Um, the quirkiest one I've seen is for confirmation of appointments to the Redevelopment Authority, the statutes require a four-fifths vote. Uh, that's the only one that I've ever seen that is you know, more than three-quarters. Uh, Agendas, if you're, uh, if you're a chair of a particular committee, agendas need to be fairly specific under the open meeting law. Uh, you note on tonight's agenda there's a, there's a chair's comments. That's on the fringe. Uh, you see that on the council meetings too, mayor's comments. Uh, uh, really, if you know what you're going to be talking about, what those comments deal with, uh, that should be on the agenda, that uh, you're going to talk about X, Y, and Z. Uh, you know, it's probably you get by with the uh, mayor's comments or chair's comments if it's 
fairly innocuous, but if you're getting into something hot and heavy that the public really is interested in and you think uh, would want to know in advance so that they could be there, uh, you should be more specific in your listings on your agendas. Uh, <clears throat> enactment of legislation, you've got ordinances and resolutions. Basically, uh, in ordinances, you've got two types. You've got charter ordinances that are basically amend the city's charter. The city's charter is composed of the general charter law, which is uh, in the statutes that lists a number of things that uh, municipalities, cities can do. Uh, when you amend that charter, for instance, the, as I mentioned, the, the mayor's line item veto on the budget, that took a charter ordinance uh, because that was different than the statutory uh, requirements for, uh, for budgets. It, it's uh, not in conflict. The statutes don't address it, so it's not in conflict with the state law. You can't adopt an ordinance or a resolution that's in conflict with state law, but anything that's not addressed by state law is really fair game uh, as far as the city goes, as far as legislation. Um, a charter ordinance doesn't go into effect for 60 days and gives the citizens an opportunity to call for a referendum. If they do uh, get sufficient signatures for a referendum, it goes to a vote and it's not effective until the, uh, the vote takes place. Uh, <clears throat> a regular ordinance goes in our municipal code of ordinances, which is this black book here. It used to be in the old days when we were flush with money, uh, all the aldermen had a copy of this on their desks. Uh, now, good news is that it's online, it's on the city website. All this is there. Uh, you have to go through a couple of gyrations to find it, but there, there's a, a, an icon for municipal codes, click that, uh, then you hit a, uh, the line on, on there that says uh, the municipal code corporation or something to that effect uh, who codifies our ordinances. Uh, the zoning code is harder to find, but it is, uh, it is on the uh, city's website as well. Uh, what I did today to find it was I typed in in the search box zoning and uh, it came up under uh, zoning and there was a reference to the city zoning code and you click on that and it brings up the city zoning code. The zoning code is not in this book. That's a separate about 150 page document uh, that the planners primarily have. I've got a copy as well but it is online. Uh, I just noted today though that there's not a table of contents for that so you got to scroll through a lot of text in order to uh, find what you're looking for. I guess my advice if you've got an issue with regarding zoning or for something for your constituents you should talk to the planning department and let them you know find the specific sections for you and bring it up and they can answer your questions. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the other set of ordinances that are not in this code book and are, that are not online are what we uh, kept from <clears throat> being uh, recodified at the request of the Municipal Code Corporation last time we redid this book that dealt with personnel regulations. Those are in the former code book in, the, in what was chapter 29. So uh, you'll hear me refer to the chapter 29 of the 1975 Municipal Code. That is the personnel regulations. Uh, number of things in there, uh, but that are, they're not online. And uh, at some point that should be cleaned up and either uh, transposed to the code book or rewritten or, or done away with 
and made uh, uh, have them as a resolution or something else. But uh, uh, and we're getting to a point with the uh, with the new <coughs> uh, budget repair bill and the doing away with collective bargaining. Uh, we're our HR department is creating a new employee handbook. Uh, there's a lot of different things in there than what's than the personnel sorts of things in our old code. So now is probably a, we're getting to a good time to clean up our old personnel regulations in the code. But if you got any questions as to what's in Chapter 29 uh, at any point, let me know. I've got a copy. I maintain that. Um, HR has got a copy as well. <clears throat> as far as your liability for your actions, uh, number one, uh, it's not in the outline, but uh, the issue has come up a couple of times about uh, whether or not uh, something you say on the council floor, if you can be, uh, somebody can sue you for libel or slander. Uh, the general rule is Statements you make on the council floor during a council meeting are privileged and you can't be found liable for libel or slander. Uh, you say those same things outside of the meeting, uh, it's, you don't have that same privilege. Uh, it's not to say it's necessarily actionable libel or slander, but uh, uh, you've got fair amount of legislative protection on the council floor. That doesn't mean you uh, should get up and start uh, making comments about your uh, constituents or fellow citizens, but uh, you've got some protection as far as being personally sued for those sorts of things. Uh, also, there, Wisconsin has very, very strong protections, indemnifications for public employees, public officials. Uh, and it is in the outline. State law requires a municipality to pay any judgment for damages and costs entered against the municipal official or employee for acts performed within the scope of employment. So as long as you're within the parameters of acting within the scope of your employment, which is pretty broad, it's unless you're engaged in some uh, malicious type activity or intentional wrongdoing, uh, typically you're going to be within the scope of your employment as an alderman and uh, if you're sued, uh, the city will handle the defense and you're not going to have to go out and hire your own attorney and so forth uh, for defense of those things where you're acting within the scope of your employment. Uh, cite another section there, municipal officials indemnified by the municipality for negligent acts taken within the scope of the employment. Uh, supplies the most foreseeable actions taken by municipal officials in the scope of their employment. However, a failure of an officer to give notice to the municipality as soon as reasonably possible of an action commenced against them can be a bar to recovery of the cost of the defending the action. In other words, if uh, somebody sued you for actions you took in your capacity as an alderman and uh, they just, for whatever reason, they didn't name the city and they didn't mention any other alderman, they just named you and served you, unless you need to bring that to the attention of the city. Uh, then the city will handle the defense and so forth. Uh, the city's got insurance, uh, we hire typically uh, outside counsel uh, and go from there. But so, general rule: unless you're engaged in uh, criminal behavior or malicious, willful conduct, uh, you don't have to worry about because you're an alderman running out and talking to your insurance salesman and and ramping up your insurance coverage. Now, that's may, may be a good idea to do in general, but. Uh, you're not opening yourself up to a ton of personal exposure as an alderman. Uh, <clears throat> as, as a council member, uh, you will be addressing a lot of claims that are filed by your constituents. Uh, 
People file claims against the city for all sorts of things. Uh, you have to look at it. <clears throat> I guess you can look at it any way you want, but my advice to you is uh, as a representative of the city, uh, you need to review, look at those things from the standpoint of the city and the city taxpayer. Uh, <clears throat> typically, anybody wanting to sue the city, they generally have to file a claim. It comes to the council, gets referred. Now it'll get referred to the finance committee. Uh, used to go to risk management. We've done away with that committee. Go to finance. Finance will review the claims. <clears throat> We've got city staff goes over these claims before the committee meets and makes a recommendation to the committee. Uh, but my, my request is that even though it's somebody from your district, uh, one of your constituents, uh, you're not their, their representative on their claim. You're representing the city and the, the city's purse. Uh, yeah, you can keep them advised as to what's going on, but I guess I would caution you from wanting to bring your constituent into the committee and plead, plead their case and so forth uh, nothing legally prohibiting that, but uh, it, it uh, makes the process a lot more cumbersome. Uh, typically, if it goes through the process, the committee makes a recommendation to the council, the council acts on all the claims, uh, <clears throat> either allow the claim, pay the claim, whatever uh, they're asking for, or to deny the claim. If we deny it, we send them a notice saying, uh, Council is denying your claim, and uh, if you want to sue the city, you've got six months in which to do it. That's that's the statute of limitations if you've served notice of disallowance properly on the uh, constituents or on the, the claimants. Uh, we get a lot of trip and falls on sidewalks. That's probably the number one that I can think of. Number two are uh, uh, injuries to vehicles by snow plows. Uh, a lot of those, well, I shouldn't say a lot, but the fair number of those we pay because uh, it, it's pretty obvious a parked car and there's a big scrape right at the level of the snow plow. Uh, we probably did something wrong there. Uh, and a lot of those we will pay. Uh, we don't pay a lot of trip and fall sidewalk type claims. Uh, but that's, again, that's a policy decision that the council makes on those sorts of things. Uh, and you're looking at it from the standpoint, and you need to look at it from the standpoint of the city overall and the city's taxpayers as to how liberal or conservative you want to be as far as paying claims, uh, liability claims. As I mentioned, we do have insurance through Cities and Villages Mutual Insurance Company. Uh, <clears throat> Through them, we, uh, we have some sort of special coverages. One's an employment practices liability policy that covers us in the event of, for instance, an Angela Payne lawsuit where there's uh, some uh, allegation of uh, employment discrimination. Uh, but all our coverages, we're, we're not, they're not first dollar coverages. Uh, we're now We've gone up over the years on our self-insured retention. I believe we're now up to $125,000 of self-insured retention. So the first $125,000 of our cost, whether it's defense costs or paying the claim, is on the city nickel. Uh, anything over and above that is more the catastrophic type losses are covered by the insurance policies. <clears throat> uh, Public official immunity, I've got on page four, again, broad when performing discretionary acts. Uh, three exceptions where there's no immunity if official employee conduct is malicious, willful, or intentional, negligently performing a ministerial duty, that, uh, or if the official is aware of a danger that is of such quality that the public officer's duty to act becomes absolute, certain, and imperative. Now that last exception has come up in the last five years or so in a couple of uh, lawsuits that have gone to the state Supreme Court uh, dealing with, uh, not so much aldermen, but uh, dealing with, say, police officers 
where there's been uh, some major, major weather condition, traffic lights are out and the officer goes out and starts directing traffic at a particular intersection and uh, arguably uh, gives the wrong signals to the wrong cars or has two cars uh, come and uh, collide. The issue is there, they sue the city. Uh, is the officer entitled to uh, public uh, official immunity? The city held uh, uh, not liable in those cases. Uh, generally, the courts are saying, yeah, they're not held liable. Those are discretionary type actions. They're not purely ministerial. Ministerial duty, uh, the courts have defined very pretty narrowly as uh, where it's some a particular duty that is spelled out very specifically for a particular public official and on as to how to fill it. And if you don't fill it according to that particular manner, uh, you can be held liable. Uh, but typically, uh, a lot of things involve discretion, and if it's discretionary, typically the official will be, uh, there'll be no immunity. Now that, uh, where, uh, where that also comes up and where uh, doesn't, these, these rules don't necessarily apply is in federal civil rights cases. Again, this is mostly uh, law enforcement uh, excessive use of force type claims, and we've we've had them. Um, one thing with federal civil rights suits, there's no cap on damages. Under under state law claims, as I've got at the top of page four, there there are caps for municipalities. So that uh, typically, uh, somebody files a claim for trip and fall, state court action. Uh, the maximum they can recover is $50,000 per claim. Uh, now, th there's three people that get injured and you can triple that, but uh, federal civil rights suits, there's no cap on damages. Uh, <clears throat> open meeting law we've talked about. Uh, <clears throat> one thing we haven't talked about really much is uh, well, we talked a little bit about, I guess, the uh, walking quorums. Uh, same rules apply on, for instance, emails or instant messaging. If, uh, I guess I'd analogize it this way, uh, if, if what you're doing via email is more like a conversation back and forth where you're discussing something and somebody's responding relatively quickly and you you shotgun this out to all the other aldermen and everybody's commenting back and forth and so it's like a discussion that's that's a meeting of the governmental body and that's improper uh, it's a violation of the open meeting law if if it's more like where you send out an email to the other aldermen not requesting a response, but just for information, hey, this is coming up, uh, and you're not expecting, and you don't get into this bantering back and forth, uh, so it's more like sending out a letter, and maybe you get a response in a few days, like you might with a letter. Uh, that's not going to be likely held to be an illegal meeting, because it's more like correspondence as opposed to conversational uh, any other questions about open meetings? I'll go on to the ethics code. I, I've got public records law here. I won't go into that. We've talked some about that, especially as it relates to emails and things. Uh, I would cite you, uh, cite on the cover sheet, there's a Department of Justice website that's very good on open records law and public records law. There's a compliance manuals that the Attorney General's Office puts out on uh, 
open records and public records that is very good and I give the site there on the cover sheet. <clears throat> if you've got, also as to any of this, if you've got any questions on anything that relates to the city, uh, uh, anything to do with legal issues, give our office a call. That's what we're there for. We're just down the hall here. <clears throat> uh, unlike the clerk's office, we do close over the noon hour, but uh, we're there, our office open eight to five. Uh, and if, if you got a question on a weekend and needs an answer, give me a call at home. My number's in the phone book, if you can find a phone book. Uh, uh, but uh, we're, we're there to assist you. We, uh, I represent you as the council. Uh, I don't represent, I don't do private legal work. I represent the city and that, so my focus is you folks. Uh, if you got legal issues, give us a call and the sooner the better uh, so we can address them. And, and if you got questions about anything with respect to the city, give us a call if you can't think of uh, anybody else that's more appropriate to call in the city. Uh, anyway, getting to the ethics code, uh, we've got an ethics code, it's in the uh, ordinances, it's in chapter uh, two. Uh, I'll step back a second. As far as the code book, the municipal code, chapter two is the administration, covers a lot of things that in your spare time, if you've got, uh, you want to fall asleep, uh, look at the website, chapter two is administration. It has a lot of, a lot of things in there that deal with procedures of the council, uh, uh, how, you, how the council operates, the agendas, when the meetings are, uh, everything dealing with the administration of the city is in chapter two. Uh, includes the various rules of the council and so forth uh, are all in there. Also included in there is the ethics code and that's sections 2-261 to 2-277. Uh, I'll say initially the city under the code adopts section 19.59 also, which is the code of ethics for local government officials uh, by reference. That's statutory code. In addition, we've got our local code uh, <clears throat> that uh, both of which address two major subject areas, uh, personal interests and financial interests. Financial interest, uh, obviously any interest which he would yield directly or indirectly a monetary or other material benefit to you as an officer of the city or to any person employing or retaining the services of uh, you or an employee. Personal interest is interests arising from blood or marriage relationships or close business or political associations, whether or not any financial interest is involved. Uh, this, this ties in also to uh, abstentions. A lot of times uh, issues come up, uh, say uh, liquor licensing and uh, your spouse or your son or daughter has applied for a, a liquor license uh, you're acting <coughs> capacity as an alderman voting on the liquor licenses. Uh, should you abstain from voting on granting your son or wife or whoever uh, a liquor license, my advice would be uh, yes, you should abstain from those sorts of things. How you do that when, uh, when typically the liquor licenses come in, there are a long, long laundry list of them you can request a division of the question so that uh, particular licenses could vote, be voted on separately. You could abstain from those and then act on, you vote properly on all the others. Uh, the, uh, the primary gist of the ethics code is to preclude you benefiting your family uh, or, or yourself personally or financially by, uh, by what you do as an alderman. Uh, we, the council has by ordinance established an ethics uh, board which is 
basically the same as the Committee of the Whole. It's all the members of the Council chaired by the Committee of the Whole chair. Uh, <clears throat> Law and Licensing has been designated as a subcommittee of the Ethics Code. If you have any issues that come up, uh, oftentimes you get invited to attend a dinner or some, uh, some meal is offered to you. Uh, I guess the first question you should ask is, are you, why am I being invited to this when I don't know these guys from Adam? Uh, is it because I'm an alderman and might this have you know, something to do with what that they're going to be coming looking to me as an alderman through the council for some uh, permission to do something, for instance? Uh, I guess I'd recommend generally if you're getting invited because you're an alderman, uh, if you want to attend that function, I would suggest you contact them and say, look, uh, I'd be happy to attend, uh, but I'd like to uh, reimburse you for the reasonable cost of the meal, and I'll, I'll pay you for it. Uh, I don't want to create a, an appearance of a conflict of interest, so uh, I'll go and you know, pay the reasonable cost of the meal or whatever. Uh, but generally, if it's a request, then it's, they're inviting the general public you don't have that same sort of ethical issue. Uh, I know it was kind of funny, we had a situation a number of years ago when Chili's opened out in the Deer Trace Shopping Center and they were calling uh, a bunch of aldermen and city employees uh, to come out the day before, have a meal before they were uh, open for business and the issue was whether attending there would be an ethics code violation. Uh, happens that Chili's is in the village of Kohler, not the city of Sheboygan, so it really wasn't an ethics issue. Uh, uh, I didn't go, but uh, if, if I had, it wouldn't have necessarily been an ethics violation. But uh, in the old days, I don't know if they still do it, Marcus used to provide movie passes to all the aldermen. I don't know if you get that or not. Uh, it's probably because we've kind of clamped down on that. Uh, Bill Wangaman and I would qualify for the senior discount on Friday afternoon. You know, generally, these businesses and things are offering these things to you, not because you're a great person, but because there may be some benefit to them in the long term if they give you a special benefit such as free movie passes or something like that. Uh, I'm not saying necessarily that that's a violation of the ethics code to accept those, but I know personally I don't accept those. Uh, you may get requests from some business people in town to uh, attend a Bucks game or something with them. Uh, I guess you gotta look at it. Are, you know, are you personal friends with this individual? That's, that's one scenario. If you don't know them hardly at all, but the, they're inviting you, the likelihood is uh, they're going to be looking for something from you in return uh, as an alderman. I guess my advice there, again, similar to the meal situation, is if you want to go, say you'd be happy to go, but you pay the, you know, the face value of the ticket. Or, uh, or decline to go. Uh, when in doubt, call our office. We'll discuss it. Uh, that, uh, if you follow our advice, you get a little extra protection. If you are sued, you can say, well, geez, uh, Steve said it was okay. <laughs> uh, but if, if it's a big issue and you need a formal ethics opinion, that's what the ethics board is there for. Uh, and it may not be an ethics issue. Uh, issue came up with, uh, in this regard, with uh, members of employees out of the wastewater treatment plant a number of years ago. The question was whether or not they could borrow tools from the treatment plant to take home to work on their cars or something like that. Uh, that was addressed by the 
ethics board through the law and licensing committee and the council basically said that's okay we'll allow that to, so that really takes away the ethics violation if the council as a policy says it's okay to do something then it then it's okay to do it uh, i've talked about disclosure of confidential information i've really talked about the section on gifts and favors i've kind of talked about that with meals and tickets and so forth uh, i'll stop there unless anybody's got questions any questions for Attorney McLean? I could, okay. I could spend hours on this. You only went 20 minutes over to Attorney McLean, otherwise we would have been here oh, you, until you 10. You should have given me the, uh, the action. <laughs> <laughs> this is the short version. Yeah. Okay, uh, the next thing on the agenda is the next meeting date that'll to, that'll to be determined and I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. We have a motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? Chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you everybody. Thanks Steve.